Well, good morning. I think we'll get started. I'll first ask, um, can people hear me pretty well? Yes, sounds good. Great, thank you. So welcome this morning to the um, fifth um, Integrated Pest Management Online Conference that we're hosting here from the Northeastern Integrated Pest Management Center. I'm Deb Grantham. I'm the director of the center. Uh, uh, most of you have worked with Jana Hexter and, and um, getting ready for this event. And I appreciate all of her work and Kevin's work in getting this uh, organized and running. Um, these are these presentations are from the project directors of active projects that are funded by the Northeastern IPM Center's partnership grants, which are uh, USDA funding, and also updates from um, from PDs who have received funding from Nor Northeast SARE, Sustainable Ag and Education Program, and USDA NEFA's Applied Research and Development Program, ARDP, and the Extension Implement Implementation Program, EIP, also USDA NEFA. So we have set this up so they're pretty rapid fire five minute presentations the speakers will discuss show sing about one or two highlights from their projects um, we want really with this um, event to increase collaboration visibility of their projects awareness of, of ipm related research and extension in the northeast and i'll emphasize we do want we do hope that some additional collaborations will occur because of this event um, well, I want to remind people that if you have questions in the lower part of your screen is a Q&A feature. Please use that Q&A feature to ask questions and we have somebody monitoring that so we can um, get that answer to the speaker and it may be answered live, it may be answered um, in, in the Q&A box. So please use that rather than chat and please um, do feel free to put to put questions in there. We're, we welcome those. So our first speaker is Dr. Yolanda Chen, um, who was funded by Northeast SARE. Uh, her um, presentation will be on reproductive ecology of Swede midge and pheromone mating disruption. She is at the University of Vermont. Um, Dr. Chen, I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, this is an exciting uh, virtual conference here. Um, so my lab has been working on Swede midge, a slow moving invasive species um, now found in many uh, Northeastern states. Uh, so this is a picture of the adult midge, which is only um, about two millimeters in size. Um, this is uh, a very difficult pest to control, uh, mostly because none of the foliar insecticides really work. And so organic uh, farmers are particularly hard hit and we have Heard of cases of 100% losses for organic growers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Swede midge particularly is specialized on cruciferous or brassica crops and um, can lead to um, basically deforming the, the plants themselves. Um, uh, broccoli and cauliflower are most susceptible and um, the midge feeding can lead to complete loss of the head. Uh, we found that only a single midge larva can make um, a broccoli head unmarketable. Uh, next slide please. And so basically um, in order to prevent damage um, we are focusing on trying to prevent overposition. Uh, next slide please. Uh, and so that means um, our lab has been focused on repelling the midge uh, females and then also trying to prevent mating. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, so I have had previous funding um, from USDA to look at the efficacy of um, the female sex pheromones and using that for pheromone mating disruption. And we've found that um, these synthesized female sex pheromones can confuse male midges in the lab and field. Midges are really particularly challenging just because of the structure. Um, there's a particular structure, uh, structural conformation for um, the midge pheromone that makes it more expensive than typical kind of moth uh, pheromones. 
And this expense makes it uh, a little bit more challenging to implement in the field. So we've been kind of working with a supplier to kind of try to reduce the prices. But then also one of the other challenges is that we're working in kind of rotational systems. Next slide, please. Um, and so the problem is uh, pheromone mating disruption up till now has been mostly implemented in perennial um, uh, systems like uh, orchard crops, uh, orchards, and then also vineyards. And so within kind of a rotational system, uh, midges can emerge from previous, um, previously infested fields and then fly to the current field. So we are trying to understand in our SARA grant where um, midges, um, when do midges emerge and where do they mate in the landscape? Next slide, please. Um, so we um, have just finished our first field season and we've been working on um, looking at where they mate, how long do they remain in the soil. So we've taken large batches of midge um, pupa and we've been putting them in into the soil. We'll be monitoring them over several years um, to just see kind of do the majority of the midges um, uh, emerge the following year or is it multiple years and that will influence kind of how many different fields um, need to actually be treated under a pheromone mating disruption like program. Uh, next slide. Um, we have also been um, starting work on just trying to understand the um, midge, um, the basically the midge um, dispersal range and we've been working at putting fluorescent powder on the midge um, and looking at kind of how far away we can capture them. Um, for some of you the midge um, really uh, kind of invades um, and ex expands and disperses really slowly so that's part of the reason why even though the midge has been in the um, U.S. for um, uh, I think something like yeah like 13 years now um, it is still very, very slow to kind of, um, you know, cause really major outbreaks. So we found like typically it takes about six to seven years to really see um, major losses and the losses are mostly borne by organic growers. And so um, we're hoping through our grant to kind of start putting together a lot of the information around the reproductive ecology of the midge in order to develop um, kind of a more effective um, implementation of pheromone mating disruption within a rotational system. Next slide. I think that's it. Um, I guess I have a couple of minutes for qu questions. Yes, you do. <laughs> I guess I went a lot faster than 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 needed. Um, yeah, we also have been working on um, the ideas of repellency, and we've um, uh, uh, found that. Um, some essential oils seem to be more repellent to the midge. Um, and, and so uh, some of the data is not super clear cut, but we've been working on kind of whether both kind of the repellent essential oils and the, the pheromone mating uh, disruption can be combined in the field um, to kind of both kind of deal with both the males and um, repelling the females that might mate outside of the fields. Thank you. We, we do have one question, Dr. Chen, so far. Okay. And that is um, from Carol Delaney. Are there any predictive indicators for a Swede midge infestation? Um, so really, we found that the most telltale sign is, um, occurs when, when you see distorted growth on the crop. Uh, there are pheromone mating, uh, there, sorry, there are pheromone traps that can be purchased. Um, and but it does take kind of a more trained eye to be able to identify the midge in the traps. Um, but yeah, the unfortunate thing is for the plants themselves, like um, by the time growers see the damage, um, it is already too late. We found that um, the, the midge larva leaves about two weeks after, you know, egg hatch, and then damage symptoms first appear at three weeks after overposition. So that makes it really challenging for growers even uh, to kind of monitor and then tra uh, train. Um, so I see another uh, question was, can a farmer predict in the future if a Swede midge attack is likely? Um, so yeah, there are, have been models around kind of the Swede midge distribution. And it really looks like, you know, all the kind of area that um, grows brassicas is uh, vulnerable. 
the midge ha uh, has a European distribution from Turkey all the way um, up to Northern Europe. So um, this, the equivalent climates would be also um, likely areas where it will um, be established. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, we will probably collect more questions so we can keep um, sending those to you and maybe maybe you can respond in writing in the Q&A box. But next I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Surinder Chopra from Penn State University. Um, he will be talking about, his funding was the ARDP funding from USDA NEFA, and his talk is on flavonoids for resistance against plant pests. So um, Dr. Chopra, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, so my name is Surinder, and um, this is a, a pretty brand new grant that we recently received um, from CPPM ARDP program. And in fact, the success of this grant, I attribute to my two entomologist colleagues. So uh, my lab has been working on uh, plant natural compounds, especially focusing on uh, these secondary metabolites known as flavonoids. So flavonoids are uh, non-essential, uh, considered to be non-essential for the growth and development of the plant. However, they are stress-induced and induced by both abiotic and biotic stress. So this grant basically, uh, which involves, as I mentioned, Dr. Gary Felton from Entomology Penn State and Julian Bujian from uh, uh, University of Florida from the Everglade Research Center. Um, our main crops are uh, maize and sorghum, corn and sorghum, and we are basically tackling or trying to investigate uh, two problematic areas uh, while trying to understand how would flavonoids interact with uh, different insects, which include fall armyworm, which is our major focus. Then there is also the problem of uh, silk fly, corn earworm, and different types of aphids that are present in landscape of um, University of Florida uh, research farm, Everglade research farm. Uh, as well as some of these insect pests are sporadically appearing sometime in our uh, Pens Pennsylvania state, for example, in the uh, in the state in in the counties like Montgomery County, where we are interacting with uh, uh, farmers and county agents in order to uh, see how we can understand uh, different insect pests that can be. Uh, control using um, uh, natural compounds uh, produced by the plant. Um, and so the, the, the second main then problem is that how can we reduce the use of uh, these uh, synthetic chemicals that are unsafe to human health and also to our environment? So with these two goals, this project has been developed uh, based on several preliminary data. And I won't discuss everything with you today, but I just want to mention that um, uh, the project actually uh, now is looking for a graduate student is somebody who is very innovative and would like to participate in, uh, um, in a sort of out of the box kind of project that we are looking at plant compound to see their efficacy against different insects. Uh, in the past, we have seen these type of compounds in our lab that are very broad, uh, not only acting as kind of like insecticide, but also they are fungicidal in nature, but also in uh, bacterial -cidal as well as, as aphidicidal. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, flavonoids have very um, sort of three ring simple structure. As you can see on the right side of the slide, uh, it has a few um, functional groups like hydroxyl group or uh, charges on the oxygen in the center ring structure. And these are some of the, the, the groups, functional groups that provide antioxidant activities uh, to these, this class of uh, flavonoids. So we don't know exactly what's the mechanism. How does this class of flavonoid interacts with different insects or fungi? But it's pretty astonishing that, that they have very broad range of 
activity against different microorganisms as well as uh, as well as insects and fungi. So uh, the novelty of this project that we think is that um, this group of flavonoids have never been deployed against insects. And secondly, we have developed uh, resources that we are able to economically produce in large quantity uh, these compounds, both from corn and sorghum genotypes that we have been breeding or, or mutating in order to um, develop efficient metabolic pathway for producing these compounds. So we have so now for this project, what we'll do is we will test uh, breeding lines of sorghum and maize that we have developed at Penn State. Um, and we will do multi-location trials of these lines and see how these lines that produce these compounds in different quantities, uh, how are they able to um, um, see, or we can see how they are able to uh, tackle the, uh, the the insect pressure in these different locations because insect pressure varies in Montgomery County, for example, is very low. Penn State Farms is very low, whereas the fall armyworm uh, insect pressure is very high in Everglades um, area uh, where um, University of uh, Florida Farm is. And, and secondly, uh, we will try that we will uh, assess that the metabolic pathway that we have now engineered um, in these plants, uh, how can we efficiently harvest those compounds um, without the expense of the yield of the plant, of course. Um, and then our ultimate goal is to uh, you know, try to develop some sort of uh, a spray natural compound that we can test in the field setting, as well as in the greenhouse setting first, of course, in order to see their effectiveness against uh, different pathogens as well as insects. Um, I don't know if we can click on the second URL down below. Um, um, we, we need to move on to the next talk. Uh, okay. so, so thank you very much, Dr. Chopra. And at the end of this first half hour, we'll have a slot for more questions. So we will watch for questions for you specifically in the Q&A as well as the other speakers. All right, thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Julie Urban, also from Penn State. Uh, her funding is from the Northeast, Northeastern IPM Center, and she is giving an update on the spotted lanternfly 2019 field season. I will pass so, it over to you, Julie. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, great. So we have a lot of research going on with spotted lanternfly, but I wanted to give you an update um, in terms of research in really the most critical area, and that's spotted lanternfly's impact on vines. Next slide, please. So in well, in um, north the northeast U.S., this is the latest um, update map for the distribution of spotted lanternfly. And so you can see the areas in blue in the eastern side of Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, Delaware, and in Virginia, those are areas that are currently under quarantine where there are established populations of spotted lanternfly. The yellow um, counties are, are areas where populations of lanternfly aren't known to be established, but at least an individual lanternfly hitchhiker has been detected. And so what we know, if you look at that area, that it's currently impacting a really important um, grape growing region in southeastern Pennsylvania, as well as in New Jersey. And there are areas under um, Maryland that are actually calling a quarantine too. And so um, with the threat of potentially lanternfly moving up, you know, out into Long Island and, and further into, into New York, um, we're really, really concerned about grapevines. Next slide. And so what we saw um, last year and even this year is that um, basically grapevines are, spotted lanternfly is killing grapevines. And so um, we know from a study that was done looking at the spray records of, of five growers as of um, last year um, that we saw grapevine death, almost 90% 90, 90 yield loss in a 40 acre planting, um, a complete death of eight acres, and yield reduction, and we're actually seeing that continue into this year. And so in looking at, in looking at what this is costing in order to 
um, try to keep lanternfly out of vineyards, we see that just for lanternfly, um, growers have increased their number of insecticide applications from four to 14, and that's nearly tripled the cost. And what's interesting there is that, um, and what's really sad there is that, you know, while these sprays will kill the lanternfly that's in the vineyard, um, just waves of more lanternfly keep coming in. And so they're increasing that cost, but they're still seeing loss to their vines. Next slide. And so this is a picture of that 40 acre vineyard, um, completely dead as of May this spring. Um, there's a couple other vineyards you could go to that um, where you could see similar scenes. And so this is supposed to be the fun update. Um, that, that's the problem, but what are we doing to solve it? Next slide. We have some really cool studies. Um, we don't have lanternfly anywhere near our experimental vineyards, which is somewhat of a problem. It's really hard to convince growers to let you put lanternfly on their vines when it's going to potentially kill it, but we found one who would. And so um, this is at Martin Kubek's house. And what you can see on the left is that's um, impact of spotted lanternfly last year, where we see failure to set fruit. And so what we wanna do is really understand how lanternfly is impacting these grapevines. And so we have a series of 16 vines that we built these individual panels on to the right at, at Martin Kubek's Vineyard. Uh, next slide. And this study is actually leading, being led by our viticulturist, Michaela Centenari. And here you can see one plant. And what we have hooked up to it are, um, is a flow meter and a dendrometer. And so what we're doing is in these 16 cages, we're introducing either no lanternfly for control or low, medium, and high levels of lanternfly. Um, and we're introducing them uh, six times throughout the course of the season. So what we're doing is we'll introduce the bugs onto the vines um, to the densities you see on the slide. You know, So at a high SLF load, we're putting 200 lanternfly in vines, onto vines. You think that might be excessive, but um, Heather Leach, who is looking at um, who's surveying vineyards for us, she's found as many as 456 lanternflies on a single vine. So this is certainly not out of the realm of reason. And so we'll let the lanternflies feed for four days, take them off, let the plants potentially recover for four days, you know, to simulate what we would see when a grower would spray and whatnot. And we're measuring various aspects of great plant physiology, carbon assimilation and leaf photosynthesis, water transport through the xylem and phloem. And so that'll be really interesting to see essentially in real time. And then also the accumulation of carbohydrates and nutrients in the fruit, as well as how it's stored in the trunk, stem and root tissues. So we're pretty excited that this is going to provide us some really good insights. Um, preliminary results show that, especially at high levels of lanternfly feeding, we're seeing um, pretty impactful effects on plant photosynthesis and transpiration. And so this, this experiment is going to be really, um, I, I think, help us come up with economic thresholds that are going to be really useful for managing grape in these vineyards. So I'm very excited about that. Next slide. Julie, we need to, we, Julie, we need to wrap it up really quickly for the next okay. In In the lab, we're also using electropenetration graph where we're able to, next slide, monitor lanternfly feeding and we're able to basically um, look at this to see exactly how and where the insect is probing. And by combining that with grape response, we're really going to have a great insight, I think, into understanding how lanternfly is able to exert this much damage in grapes. That's it. Thank you, Julie. Um, stick with us. We'll have a few minutes for questions in a little bit. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Um, the fourth slot is for Kwan Zhang, Dr. Kwan Zhang from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. But our actual speaker will be Neil, Dr. Neil Schultes from, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. So Neil, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. you. Um, <clears throat> okay, thanks. I'm here with uh, Kwan, who is behind me. Uh, we've our PIs on this project, and we're also doing it in conjunction with Daniel Cooley, who's up at the University of Massachusetts. Our work is centered on um, the disease called fire blight, which is one of the big diseases of apple and pear production. Um, it's caused by a bacteria called Irwinia amylovera. Our Irwinia amylovera happens to be a new world um, species that does particularly well on rosaceous plants, particularly apples and pears, which are old world species. Um, it's found not only throughout the United States, but it's uh, 
made its way over to Europe and other parts of the world as well. Um, and it's encroaching on areas uh, where Apple origin of domestication is occurring in Uzbekistan region and elsewhere. So it's one of the big diseases of Apple and pear production. And um, <clears throat> it can lead to uh, devastating losses of, of plant uh, crops and also of the trees themselves if it enters into the vascular system. The big um, area of infection is during the flowering period um, in the springtime and it can then make its way through the flowers and into developing root and into the vascular system. There are different uh, cultivars of apples. Some are uh, with a wide range of uh, susceptibilities to Erwinia, but particularly young um, apple trees are very susceptible to fire blight infection, uh, Erwinia infection. And the shift over to high density planting where trees are spaced some 18 inches apart really uh, makes this a big problem where you can get devastating losses depending on the environmental conditions. So we centered our research on looking at um, replacement strategies of biocontrol agents and bio uh, <clears throat> pesticides um, to uh, replace uh, antibiotics. Streptomycin um, is usually sprayed during flowering time and that's the, the most effective control of this disease. Um, of course, it's a bacteria and you're gonna get resistance to the disease, although it hasn't yet been found in New England uh, yet, but it is found throughout the, uh, the different parts of the country. And of course, organic farmers cannot use um, antibiotics in their spray, so they need various control agents and antibiotics are not used either in Europe. So we looked at a number of different biocontrol agents in conjunction with some biocides. And um, our most promising one is, um, a biocontrol agent called Blossom Protect. It's a com combination of two different yeasts, as well as with a biocide oxidate, which is a hydrogen dioxide. And here we have data that has been spread over five different years at the Connecticut Ag Station and also in Massachusetts, where we look at um, a randomized um, infection of, of, uh, during flowering time. We uh, apply the biocontrol agent, then we apply the Irwinia on a certain dose, and then follow up with the uh, bio, uh, biocide oxidate or WEVA, which is a copper-based compound. We're not reporting on that today. And then three weeks later, count the number of infected plants in each of the uh, different groups. If we set the streptomycin control at 100%, we're asking how well does the blossom protect itself or the blossom protect plus oxidate fare comparing to streptomycin. And we can see that over the five-year period, the blossom protective cell works about 69% as well as a streptomycin control, but in combination with oxidate, it jumps up to about 92%. Now, the Massachusetts 2018 data um, <clears throat> was subject to a little uh, change. They had a heavy dose of Erwinia put on and it really scorched the plant. So if we remove that um, data and go to the next slide, <clears throat> what we find is that your, uh, and just look at the data at Connecticut, the Blossom Protect itself is about 84% as effective and in combination with the virus uh, oxidate goes to about 110%. So it's a viable uh, alternative to using streptomycin. Um, and on the next slide, we have a little, uh, in the next slide as well, we have a little uh, Suggestion for farmers who want to use this, we applied the Blossom Protect to biocontrol to mid to full bloom, that's somewhere around um, 50 to 80% uh, opening of the flowers, so that the um, biocontrol agent can coat the flower surface and grow. And then next slide, we apply um, the uh, oxidate at full bloom. Now in our experiments, we applied the Erwinia in the morning and then followed up with oxidate. Obviously, we're not suggesting that for our growers. And then the next slide, we followed up 24 hours later with some more oxidate. It turns out in the next slide, the first application of Blossom Protect is the most um, necessary. Next slide, please. And then next slide. And the use of oxidate either once or twice is dependent on several factors. There are certain disease models that predict how well the disease is going to be and farmers often use that and applying their strategy. So if it's a light disease load, you might be able to get it by with just one spray of oxidate. If you had a history of Erwinia infection in your field, you might want to follow up with two oxidate uh, uses. 
Um, <clears throat> This uh, work has also been, uh, similar work has also been done in Michigan on the George Sundance group and in the Pacific Northwest with Ken Johnson. And it seems like Blossom Protect among the various uh, biocontrol agents is the most promising. Um, and it also works very well in the Northeast. Uh, so I think with that, we can wrap up unless you have a few things to add, okay. Thank you. Um, we have maybe a minute for questions. Uh, there's one in the Q&A for Julie Urban. Um, does anyone have questions about the fire blight presentation? I, had I, I do, I have a quick question. This is sure. Julie Carroll. Mm -hmm. What variety of apple are you doing your tests on and what is its level of susceptibility to, to fire blight as compared to the work being done in Massachusetts? Um, we, we used uh, Red Delicious uh, for most of our things. It's a susceptible variety. Um, and I'm sorry, the second part of your question was? Is that the same variety they used in Massachusetts for the one year of testing? I'm, I'm, it's a different variety and I can't uh, off the top of my head uh, know which one it was, but it was a susceptible variety. Thank you. So trying to keep on time, um, I think we'll move right along to Dr. Dina Fonseca's um, presentation. She's funded by the Northeastern IPM Center. Um, she's from the uh, Un State University of New Jersey. And her presentation is levering the expertise of the New Jersey mosquito control community to jumpstart standardized tick surveillance. Hi, hello, good morning. Um, all right, so I have, uh, we, we did what we would consider a sort of an experiment. We were trying to understand, um, you may know that ticks are a growing problem um, across the United States, especially in the Northeast uh, with uh, Lyme disease. And uh, we also have, and other tick-borne diseases, and we also have um, a new um, tick species, an invasive tick, the Asian longhorn. Um, we actually applied for this funding before we knew that we had an invasive tick and primarily the objectives were to try to understand if we could quickly um, mobilize existing mosquito control programs, of which there are 21 in, in 21 counties in New Jersey, to do, um, to do tick surveillance. So the, the tick blitz was called the New Jersey Tick Blitz. Uh, was composed of a one day training workshop for mosquito control professionals. And then a one day simultaneous tick collection in all of the 21 New Jersey counties. Jane, if you could go just click. Um, we, with the outcomes measured were levels of participation. We had participants from all 21 New Jersey um, mosquito control programs. Uh, the number of sites sampled and the ticks collected. The sites sampled were, were chosen with our aid using Google Maps and also with some site visits. And then a knowledge of interest survey, both pre and post survey and a survey score in terms of the experience itself. Could you please click again, Gina? Um, the a bonus aim, which in many ways was kind of partly the reason we did this to start with, is that we were able to do a New Jersey wide survey for a spotted fever rickettsia, um, uh, human disease in uh, Dermacenta variabilis, the American dog tick, which had never been surveyed across the, the state. Um, so the workshop was, was, um, was um, done by um, the list of people at the bottom, myself, Andrea Gizzi, which is a co-PI on the, on the grant, Alvaro Toledo, which is an, a tick expert working on Lyme disease, Bob Jordan from the Mammoth County Mosquito um, Control, uh, well, actually Mosquito Division uh, in Mammoth County, and Jim Mosi um, at the time, primarily my student, and now also now at the Department in Jersey Department of Health. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we basically provided um, detailed SOPs for tick collection, and, uh, besides the workshop, also providing information on how to identify ticks. A tick sweep, masking tape, Ziploc bag, Sharpies, collection forms, a nice carrier bag since we had a carrier pick up the ticks from all the counties, um, a t-shirt, and, and also a trip to the AMCA, the American Mosquito Control Association, which just happened to be last year in Orlando, Florida. 
So um, this allowed two members, was, was raffled, and two members of the community that was participated came to, we set up a, um, a symposium at AMCA about mosquito people starting to consider tick surveillance and tick control. Uh, click, please. Um, the Tick Blitz Day was really quite successful. We obtained 883 ticks from all 21 New Jersey counties, and that was, that's just for um, the American dog tick. Uh, we were also actually found uh, five tick species, including three new county records for the invasive Asian longhorn tick, which as I mentioned, when we first applied for this funding, we didn't even know it was in New Jersey. Um, please click. Um, so overall, um, it's just sort of a demonstration. It was a lot of enthusiasm. We feel that um, engaging with mosquito control existing programs um, can, can be one of the most cost-effective strategies for quickly developing um, tick surveillance and ultimately, uh, once we know how to do it, uh, tick control. And so this has been a, a great, I, to be honest, first time that we applied for the Northeast IPM funding and it turned out to be extremely uh, successful. We've actually already published a paper. Uh, came out in the recent issue of August of insects that was specifically geared towards um, new strategies for tick surveillance. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, have, I have one question for you. Um, I think I'll hold it till our next break, though. That'd be fine. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Nielsen, um, from, also from Rutgers in New Jersey. Her funding is Northeast SARE, and her talk is on managing BMSB and key orchard pests using reduced input methods. So Ann, I will pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold. So. Um, I think most of you are familiar with brown marmorate stink bug, but it is an invasive crop pest uh, that's been in the country since it was first detected in the mid 1990s. Um, we had an outbreak population of it in 2009, 2010, 2011, that caused fourfold increases in insecticide use in, uh, in tree fruit and disrupted long standing IPM programs. So when I started here at Rutgers, uh, we wanted to try and develop IPM tactics that our growers could apply very quickly. Um, we had previously identified that using pro protein markers, that BMSB exhibited a strong edge dispersal from, from the woods primarily um, into the crop, specifically tree fruit. Uh, so we wanted to kind of exploit this dispersal behavior, or this, edge, this edge effect uh, for BMSB by using border sprays as shown in the top left corner of the slides. Um, but we also wanted to reintroduce IPM tactics that fruit growers had abandoned uh, during the BMSB outbreak. Um, because of the intense insecticide use, they were using multiple insecticides that were controlling the other crop pests. So we wanted to reintroduce mating disruption for our internal worms, such as codling moth and oriental fruit moth. And we also introduced ground cover management to remove flowering weeds which control, uh, which is an alternative host plant for tarnished plant bug and cat facing, native cat facing insects. Um, and eventually we also incorporated using that as a way to conserve pollinators. So this study was done starting in 2014. Um, I'm presenting some data from 2016 and 2017 primarily. Um, we've done this in apples and in peaches. This is a collaborative project um, at this stage with Chris Berg, Tracy Lesky, and my former postdoc, Clement Akotz and Mensa. When we look at the data in apples, we can see that this is just shown for 2017, um, but in the top right corner, we have our stink bug injury at harvest. And in, oh, there's no legend, I'm sorry. So the green is our IPM CPR, or our IPM crop perimeter restructuring tactic, which includes the border sprays and mating disruption and ground cover management. So, and the blue is our grower standards. And grower standards in apples included either alternate row middles or a trap-based threshold um, to time management. So what we found in 2016 and 2017 on commercial farms where the growers were applying these treatments, we found equal, if not significantly less in 2016, injury from stink bug, primarily brown marmorant stink bug at harvest. Um, and what's really exciting about that is that we're using about 25% less or more um, insecticide use in these plots. So that's our reduced risk tactic. 
for brown marmorated stink bugs. So by exploiting the behavior of brown marmorated stink bug, we can effectively uh, control the pest for injury at harvest. <clears throat> we also saw in terms of our codling moth injury uh, in the bottom left of the slide, uh, just looking at two of our farm data, uh, we saw significantly less injury from codling moth at harvest uh, in two different farms in our IPM CPR tactic as opposed to our standard management programs. And that's consistent with data that's been published throughout the US and, and Europe. We were also interested in the effect of predators and parasitoids. Uh, we monitored this with yellow sticky cards and we also used sentinel egg masses, sentinel brown marmorated stink bug egg masses. We had a significant effect of predation in 2014 with higher um, predation in our IPM CPR tactics, which we were really excited about. Um, but that effect disappeared um, in 2016 and 2017. Um, so we, we saw an effect, but it was not significant over uh, the consistent years. So in Apple, to summarize that, um, we have a, a reduced risk spray program for brown marmorated stink bug that incorporates mating disruption. If you could go to the next slide, I'll present our results in peaches. So in peaches, oops, too many, one, one back. That's my next talk. So in peaches, we did the same, the same tactic. Um, we did this with the same collaborators. But I'm presenting data here from New Jersey because in New Jersey, we did our IPM CPR tactic in peaches as well. So border sprays for brown marmorated stink bug, mating disruption for oriental fruit moth and ground cover management. Um, but we, our growers here were very interested to know if we could go beyond the five acre plot size, which we had done all this work on. So we tested this at uh, five acre blocks, 10 acre blocks and 20 acre blocks, again, all on commercial farms. And so what I hope you can see here from the data is that um, our grower standards were usually five acre blocks. We saw no, no difference in 2017. So if we look at, sorry, if we look at our 2017 data, the solid bars, um, there was a significant effect um, at the 20, 20 acre size, which means the border spray kind of fell apart at that stage um, a little bit. But in 2018, uh, we saw no significant effect of size on the plots, which what this indicates is that we can use our IPM CPR tactic um, in terms of stink bug injury um, at least up to 10 acres, if not 20 acres, um, depending on the stink bug pressure in each year. So that suggests this, um, this effect, this reduced inputs that we're using to control stink bug um, is even less at the larger plot size. Um, again, this is using the border sprays and that's the stink bug injury at harvest. Um, now, we also were very interested, again, at the effect of natural enemies. So we deployed many, many, many sentinel egg masses. And what we found was that in 2017 and 2018, we didn't see any significant effect of the um, IPM CPR tactic versus our border sprays. Um, you know, disappointing, but uh, it, part of this is just because of um, we're using brown marmorate sink bug and not another um, another prey item. But what we did find primarily in our IPM blocks was that we discovered Trisulcus japonicus um, at farms in both 2017 and 2018 in our IPM CPR blocks. Now Trisulcus japonicus is the par egg parasitoid of brown marmorate stink bug. This was the first find in agricultural crops in the U.S. Um, and uh, suggests that maybe this IPM CPR tactic is compatible with biological control. And these finds, as indicated by this map here, were along the edge of the plots as we would expect for Trisulcus japonicus. So that's, that's our IPM CPR project in a nutshell. Thank you. I'll let you roll right into the next, your next presentation on the plum curopolia. Okay, so uh, plum curculio, switching gears a little bit, um, is, is a native keystone pest of both stone fruit and palm fruit and in the eastern U.S. also of blueberries. Um, the females lay their eggs inside of fruit, leaving a crescent-shaped crescent -shaped scar. Um, and where, in, where you have either multiple generations or an early harvested crop like blueberries or cherries, you can have live larvae present at the, at, in the fruit at harvest, which is a significant contamination. Now there are two gen there are two different uh, strains of plum curculio. There's a northern strain which has one generation per year, and a southern strain which is primarily bivoltine but can have multiple generations per year. Um, despite the fact that this is a native keystone pest, uh, our IPM tactics are kind of lagging behind our other 
uh, or other key fruit pests. Um, so we wanted to look to see if we could develop IPM tactics that would be compatible, that we could use in apples, peaches, and blueberries. Um, but first we had to ask the question about what strain we had in New Jersey, um, because there was some evidence to suggest that we did in fact have a southern strain. So we looked at mitochondrial CO1, which can distinguish the strains, and we also looked at degree day accumulation and abundance patterns in those fields. And from both of those data sets, we've identified that we do in fact have the southern strain of plum curculio in southern New Jersey in our peaches, and we do have live larvae present at harvest. Um, so this does change our, our management approaches um, because it had previously been managed as a U of Ulti pest. So uh, with that in mind, we did um, we sampled through multiple mechanisms for plum curculio in our orchards. This is the data from peaches in New Jersey. Um, what we see is as the adults emerge from overwintering, we see a very strong edge effect um, as identified in re red on this graph. Um, and then over the season, they become more evenly dispersed throughout the plots. Um, in blueberries, we see the same effect. Um, however, in, for, if you look only at this, the second generation in Georgia, for instance, that uh, edge effect disappears because they have already invaded the orchard. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what we wanted to do is now that we know that plum curculio has a very strong edge effect, and this is not totally novel, it just hadn't been done in blueberries and peaches. Um, we had seen this effect before in apples done by some of our colleagues up in uh, New York, sorry, Canada. Um, what we wanted to know is could we develop IPM tactics for plum curculio? And we kind of built on some of our experiences with brown marmorade stink bug by looking, trying to exploit this edge-driven behavior. Um, so we utilized a border spray again, um, and this is work done on the research farm here at Rutgers University. And what we see is when we have a control plot, which is not sprayed, a border spray plot, which had a couple border sprays applied um, against the first generation and one applied against the second generation, versus a grower standard, which had four insecticide applications. We do see a significant effect, um, especially along the edge, in terms of the number of egg scars at both the mid-season, at, at the mid-season. Um, so there's significantly less egg, uh, fruit injury in the border spray plots along the edge of the plots um, compared to the control or to the grower standard. Um, we also saw significantly less live larvae in fruit in the border spray plots compared to an untreated control. Um, but uh, again, there was a strong edge effect there. So what we're, what we're kind of coming up with after first year of data is that the border spray works However, we need to tweak and refine this approach before we take it out to grow our farms um, so that we can get better control of plum curculio um, overall. And one of the ways that we're going to do this is by integrating biological control, specifically with entomopathogenic nematodes, um, against the larvae that are in the, it, um, have, a, have um, gone out from the fruit uh, to pupate. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Anne. We're running a little behind, but we'll just cope with that. I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Lisa Tewksbury from University of Rhode Island. Uh, she uh, has funding from um, USDA NEFA EIP program, and she's looking at the evaluation of releases of Hypena opulenta as a biocontrol um, for swallow warts. So I will pass it right over to you, Lisa. Okay, good, good morning. I'm happy to talk to you about this project. It's a very long, um, uh, ongoing project as biocontrol of weeds seems to often be. And so this one began in 2005 with a graduate student, Aaron Weed, uh, at the University of Rhode Island, working with Dick Casagrande. And uh, the reason um, we looked at swallow warts um, They've been becoming more and more of an issue in the Northeast and then also in Canada. It's a uh, introduced perennial weed from Europe and it's a vining um, plant that's related to milkweeds. And it can cause quite a problem in pastures. Uh, it's also become a problem in um, Christmas trees and um, it's vining so it does grow up trees. It tends to be in Rhode Island primarily an open field issue. Um, and uh, we have, there's two different species. We have black swallowwort in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. 
Um, but in New York and parts of Canada, they have a second species, uh, which we call pale swallowwort. It has mostly, you can identify them by the flower. Um, and there they have um, it in fields, but also in forest edges. And uh, so as the program got underway, Aaron uh, worked with a group in Switzerland, uh, CABI Europe, who helped with the foreign exploration. And he identified five different species that feed on swallowworts in Europe. Um, and there they were collected on uh, black swallowwort, pale swallowwort, and a third species, um, white swallowwort, which is um, present throughout Europe. And um, Aaron, as I said, identified five species, and they were all brought into quarantine, um, both in Switzerland and also in, um, at the University of Rhode Island. We have a small quarantine facility at our URI biocontrol lab. Um, the number of things were done there. One was to confirm that the species would feed on um, both species of target swallowers. And then the other, of course, was the host specificity. And as we went through the process, um, there were two moths that uh, were found to be very host specific to swallowers. And one of them is the Hypena opulenta you see on your screen. And it, um, I would always want to call it a noctuid moth, but it's in the family Arebidae now. And uh, so it's a, um, a night flying species. And um, the larvae tend to do a bit of their feeding um, during the night as well. And um, the other species were put on hold um, either because they were not specific enough or in one case, um, <clears throat> it was a univoltine species, only one generation a year. So that's more difficult to build up populations. So once the um, host specificity information was confirmed. We went ahead and got um, a permit for release. Um, Canada received their permit first in 2014, and we received ours in 2017. So um, we're really just working our way through learning about this species and how it behaves uh, in New England. Um, the field cage there uh, that you see is a six by six um, by six field cage, which we used to be able to um, monitor our releases. And in 2018, um, the results of which you see on the top right graph are basically showing how in one of our locations, we looked at a um, release of 500 larvae in each cage in a um, full sun situation, a part sun situation, and a shade. Because we um, were concerned this insect was found in a um, wooded ravine in Ukraine and uh, so we're concerned that it would do better under shady conditions, which was um, borne out in our res um, results in 2018. So you can see um, the black line there is the um, shaded area, and there's much higher damage than in the other two situations. So in 2019, we only set up our cages in shaded sites, and we um, this time went with moths, um, releasing adult moths to then lay eggs and populate the cage. And the uh, lower right graph is just showing after the release how there was an increase in the um, plant damage inside the cage. Approximately two weeks after release, we removed the cage and we allowed the larvae to move out into um, you know, the surrounding area to have more um, foliage for feeding and also um, you know, to make it a field release, which, which was the intent. So we had um, up to 100% um, defoliation in many of our cages. Um, and I think the lowest was about 55%. And it's interesting, we have put hobos in all of the cages. So we're monitoring temperature and also light intensity. Um, and the cage with the lowest um, damage rating also had the uh, lowest uh, temperature you know, throughout the season. So uh, this is obviously an ongoing project. We're going to be going back to our areas. We'll probably do some um, mothing with black lights to see if we have um, establishment in the area. And we'll also be looking for eggs and larvae. Um, going through that, I threw in this um, picture at the bottom of a diseased swallower because in 2018, we had a real severe infestation of a pathogen. And um, we're in the process of getting it identified um, but someone is looking at that as you know, possibly uh, something you know, that could be helpful for controlling swallowwort in the future. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions if I have time. Thank you, Lisa. 
Um, we have a few minutes uh, for questions before our next speaker. Um, let's see. Uh, actually, some of the questions are for other speakers in a comment. One comment on the fire blight presentation is that uh, says that predictions of fire blight to arrive in Massachusetts. I think that's uh, a comment, not a question. Um, another question, which I think is for Ann Nielsen, is the grower standard a full cover spray? Hi, this is Ann. Can I answer now? Sure. Okay. Um, the grower spray was what the growers typically do. Um, the first few years in New Jersey, in peaches, we have um, one grower that does whole block applications and the other two would do all alternate row middles. And alternate row middles were, was what was done by our cooperators in other states as well. So most of it was alternate row middles. Okay, thanks. Um, and then uh, there's a question for Julie Urban. How can we gather well, you're already gathering some baseline pesticide application data to measure changes before and after the spotted lanternfly invasion. Um, but do growers record pesticide application data? And if yes, how could we access that data? That's a question from actually here at the Northeastern IPM Center. Is Julie still on? Uh, looks like Julie might not be on anymore. So we will send that question to her. And then I had a question for um, uh, Dr. Francesca about the, um, the tick studies, mosquito control community, two, two stick, uh, tick collection studies. Um, they, they, and the answer is that they did before and after tests during, done during the workshop day. And then they use Qualtrics survey software to follow up questions to all of the participants, as well as other members of the New Jersey Mosquito Control Programs and the State Office of Mosquito Control Commission. And they have a published manuscript that um, we can send out to people if you wish to receive that. Right, they were, we were having some trouble getting um, the questions onto the Q&A. So there was also another question about, did, I, did we work with Tick Encounter? And uh, um, the answer to that is that Tick Encounter works as a citizen science. Um, and there's quite a few citizen science Tick um, related um, programs, but we were trying to, we were working with professional and, and um, pesticide applicator certified professionals that do mosquito control. So the idea was, could we basically leverage existing um, knowledge and, and really kind of get a, a jump started on the, on the tick um, surveillance and eventually control? And, and uh, um, our conclusion at this point is that it's doable. Um, they, will, they are interested and they will obviously need additional resources. But um, the fact they already know how to do surveillance and understand how to identify insects and arachnids um, makes things much simpler. It's much easier in New Jersey because we have an extensive mosquito control program. Other states are going to have very different experiences, but we try to provide um, this as, a, as a, a, an experiment in, in and we, in the paper we actually discuss some of the limitations of this approach. So these were um, professional com commercial pest no. Now these are state, so the, the sorry they're not they're county. So in New Jersey, um, every county, uh, twenty one counties, every county has a county mosquito control program that is funded by stakeholders in the county. Um, so and then there's a this is organized by a state uh, Department of Environmental Protection, the the um, Mosquito Control Commission. Um, and there's also a New Jersey Mosquito Control Association, which was the first Mosquito Control Association. Um, now there's a national one, the American Mosquito Control Association, which was where everybody, where we had the symposium so that we kind of provided the information to the, the entire group at the, at the national level. Um, okay. Yeah, but yeah. Thank you. 
um, we can, I think, we can move on to our next speaker, Dr. Juliet Carroll from the New York State IPM program. And her funding is ARDP funding through, from USDA NEPA. And she's looking at building a responsive network of IPM applications that supports grower access and communication. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Deb. Um, so we are basically under this project doing two main things. We're rebuilding the NUA website. NUA stands for Network for Environment and Weather Applications. And we're developing data quality control subroutines to basically fix, repair any erroneous data that comes in. So we're really excited about this project. As many of you know, a lot of us in academia, but many of the grower community are moving away from desktop and laptop computers to tablet and phone size devices. And so a responsive network basically is going to be device friendly, regardless of what device you're on. So what does, what does NUA have and how are we imp, you know, fostering grower access and communication? Growers and others have weather stations. We pull in data from over 600 weather stations from states where we partner with 14 states supported by land grants and you and I put the logos across kind of circling the right hand corner of, of, of the slide so that you can see all of our partners and that weather data drives 15 pest forecast models uh, for plant diseases 11 insect phenology models and three crop management tools some of these models use degree days and basically we've got 11 degree day base temperatures that are used for these models and an exciting aspect of degree days is that we're going to create a weather query tool to make it a lot easier to access just the weather data or the degree day accumulated uh, values through this weather query tool. So yeah, we're going to be build it, building a device-friendly website. This website is going to serve up geographically relevant tools that are attributed to the NUA partner states and land grants. In other words, when you access this website, if we know your IP address and we know that you're in New Jersey, we're going to wrap that website with everything related to Rutgers, their fact sheets, all of the supporting information, it'll look like it's being brought to you by Rutgers uh, University. So the quality control is going to change garbage in into accurate out. We're going to patch missing data and we're going to be able to correct and look at temperature, relative humidity, uh, and rain data easily. The other exciting thing about this project is that we're going to be serving up just the tools that you want from the locations where you want. So you're going to be able to set up a profile and ask for the specific weather stations that you want. You won't have to sift through 600 or however many there are in a particular state. You're just going to have your profile and that profile is going to be able to save your biofix and crop information. So a grower, in order to run the apple scab model, for instance, needs to put in their green tip date. And currently they have to put that in pretty much every time they use the model if they close out their browser. All we're doing right now is saving it within the context of the browser. But this is going to have a profile to save that that biofix information. So right now we're looking at designs for the home page. Those are underway and near final. And we've been doing user experience research with our grower advisory panel to find out what growers like or don't like about the models, what they like or don't like about the web pages, what things they snag on, what they can't navigate easily. And basically we're adjusting according to that user experience research. The projected launch date for the website is November 2020. 
so we're pretty excited about that. We've got our work cut out for us to get this rolling. And the nice thing about these types of weather-driven IPM tools is that they have proven IPM impacts. We have surveyed our growers in 2017, and you can see the chart there with the responses. They are agreeing that NUA models help reduce their sprays, improve their spray timing, alert them of pest risk, and enhance their IPM. And in the areas where the growers disagree, the few that do disagree, you can see that sometimes we don't reduce sprays. So apple scab, in New York anyway, in the Lake Ontario region, it was kind of one long infection event. There were so, it was so rainy and warm. And we don't currently have true alerts. We're not pushing a text out or something like that to growers currently. So you can see that's where they might be disagreeing that it's alerting them, you know, actively sending them a message. But we're pretty excited about this. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Julie. Do you want to jump right into your next presentation on the Spotted Wind Drosophila Working Group? I sure can. And this is Northeastern IPM Center funding. Correct. So uh, the previous project, we are about halfway through. These two projects have termed, and we have finished these projects. I'll start with the working, Spotted Wing Drosophila Working Group. We do still have materials on the Working Group website for Spotted Wing Drosophila. Basically, we ran working groups in 2012, 2013, and 2014, and then the grant that I was a PI on, Greg Loeb was the PI on, on those, and then the grant that I was a PI on for the working group spanned 2016 through 2018, and our partner was Rutgers University, so Cornell University and Rutgers basically organized the working groups and brought people together from across the Northeast to discuss spotted wing Drosophila and set priorities and share resources. And I think for me, that's the most exciting aspect is that on the Northeast IPM website, you can access our priorities. And we didn't just set research and extension priorities. We also investigated the need for regulatory priorities, for instance, uh, improving, um, pre-harvest intervals on materials, two double E's, things like that. And we would have people from USDA contributing to our working group meetings uh, uh, along those lines. I think the really most exciting outcome of this project are the two IPM guides that we put together, one for raspberries and blackberries and one for blueberries. These 11 page guides are available on the website now, and they were basically pulled together with input from all of us kind of on the executive committee and Nielsen, Cesar Rodriguez Saona, Greg Loeb, Laura McDermott, Dean Polk and myself. And we also sent the drafts out to the entire working group so that they could provide feedback. The guides are full of really beautiful photographs that we got from folks. So I encourage you to visit this website and download information on SWD um, as needed. The other project um, that actually Greg Loeb, Art Agnello, and I did, uh, this was done in 2013 through 2014 just at the onset of when SWD had hit New York State. And we knew it was an issue in berry crops, but we weren't sure if, sweet, if our sweet cherry and tart cherry crops were going to be affected. Our objectives were to enhance the working group meeting that occurred in 2013 by bringing in outside speakers. And so we brought uh, other SWD specialists in from other regions in the middle, sorry, <laughs> in the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and 
Greg Loeb also tested lures under this project. The lure research has been transcended now, and there are a couple commercial lures available that um, actually have been based on the one that they were finding, which was the wheat dough based lure as being the most attractive to SWD. Um, we also looked at the level of risk to our tart and sweet cherry crops under this by trapping and collecting fruit and measuring infestation. And we found the risk to be low to moderate um, in the Hudson Valley region and the Lake Ontario regions of New York. But as we now know, that changed dramatically in 2017 in New York, as perhaps in other areas of the Northeast, SWD has basically been arriving or, or I don't know if arriving is, is correct, but you trap it for the first time earlier and earlier every year. And in 2017, a number of our tart cherry growers in the Lake Ontario region dumped their crop because it was rejected at the processor for white worms. And we know that that's, that was SWD infestation. So uh, we're, we're keeping a tighter monitoring uh, on our tart cherry crop at this time. And that's all I have. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Julie. That's my timer. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it off. I uh, I do uh, have something to talk with you about that later on. I'll send you an email note. Um, Sounds good. I'd like to introduce next Dr. Peter Gench, who's at the. Um, Cornell University at the research station in Hudson Valley. He is going to talk about citizen based, citizen science based approach to managing the brown marmorated stink bug. So Peter, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Deb. So this project is collaboration uh, with Art and Yellow at the Cornell Agritech in Geneva, and Elizabeth T, the Loft Regional Fruit Team. So as Ann Nielsen pointed out, Brown marmorated stink bug, Heliomorpha hile, or BMSB, is a recent invasive to North America. Uh, it's both an ag and an urban pest. During the fall, the adults migrate and uh, aggregate in overwintering sites and woodlands and man-made structures, and they become a nuisance pest in homes. Uh, in the spring, the adults emerge again to trouble homeowners. They move into woodland trees and agricultural crops to begin reproduction and feeding through the summer and the fall. The manage requires uh, late season insecticide applications that are quite disruptive to IBM program. So you can see the picture at the bottom left of the slide of injury to apple late in the season in the Hudson Valley. Uh, these occurred to Pink Lady in November. So during the early invasion of the invasive into new regions, the adults are most often found first in urban dwellings. So these are observed by homeowners, business employees and the like, and populations then increase uh, the MSB are found in agricultural borders and various traps and crops, then followed by crop injury, at least that was our experience in New York. Inquiries from homeowners wanting additional information on BMSB then prompt media outreach or producers to seek interviews from entomologists. This leads to sort of a broad media outreach of BMSB biology and followed up by homeowner recommendations. So you can see the images on the left of a New Yorker magazine cover as well as the New York Times representing the unks uh, found in the urban environment by homeowners and the like. Uh, use of these observations then by researchers and extension educators have uh, directed homeowners, we'll call them now citizen scientists, to provide submissions of insect specimens. These come into us as either live or digital images of specimens. They're submitted virtually. And um, where am I? And they're then confirmed by us. So we go into the mapping sites to make these confirmations and they're submitted to um, mapping sites. Uh, initially they were for urban populations, but then agricultural populations were added to these maps. And uh, the field populations then are based on either light or pheromone trapping as monitoring methods sort of evolved over time. You can see the EDD map at the top of that slide representing sort of a county based system of uh, of seeing the spread of BMSB over time. So this EDD map system was modified in New York State to accommodate for uh, agricult agricultural thresholds for brown marmorated uh, county by county. 
the use of the New York State map allows us to convey these populations of absence or presence, whether insects above or below action thresholds, and these numbers that we acquire using Tedder's pheromone trapping. It allows people to, to dig into an individual county, to drill down and look at details of life stage and overall weekly captures uh, based on those county measurements. So the thresholds would then be used by growers to step outside, scout for BMSB on their farms and begin management upon field observations of, of the insect. Uh, in 2016, the samurai wasp, Trisulcus japonicus, the upper right side of the slide, that small hymenopteran uh, parasitoid, is a biological control of, of brown marmot stink bug in Asia, and it was found in New York State at that time. It deposits its eggs in the eggs of brown marmot stink bug, and then the wasp larvae feed on the developing brown marmot stink bug nymph, and they observe as adults in that, uh, that bottom image on the right. Uh, upon the DEC approval, uh, we then began redistribute uh, efforts of samurai wasp across the state in 2017. And uh, we started this by using brown marmot stink bug parasitized eggs from the lab and then we take alpha scent yellow sticky cards out into the field to confirm that, that the releases have taken place and that they've become established over time. So continued interests by the media uh, during 17 and 18 um, for our, our spring March Madness and fall invasion uh, mapping efforts provide additional opportunities for us to again educate the public on the evolving BMSB projects we have here in the Hudson Valley. So we employed social media and crowdsource funding mechanisms and uh, citizen scientists that were interested in sort of a non-chemical approach to deal with brown marmots, think bug in and around their communities. They were provided the opportunity to support the biocontrol efforts here at the lab and redistribution of samurai or wasp in their communities in 2018. Uh, we continued that this year in 2019. We provide them parasitized eggs that were fixed to Petri dishes, sent out overnight to citizen science participants these were set out in their backyards and then returned to us to, and we determine the percent emergence of each of those eggs in each of those locations. And if we need to reapply, we would do that again. So if you advance to the next slide, please. In New York State, we have three major uh, tree fruit growing regions that are represented by the larger yellow circles. In the upper left are two maps that, that show the EBB map modified for New York State to show action thresholds for growers that we send out through uh, our blog site. Uh, the citizen science redistribution of samurai wasp is represented by the red dots there on the map and the yellow dots are represented uh, through our agricultural efforts. So presently in New York State there's 104 redistribution sites of samurai wasp to, to reduce brown marmots think bug across the state. Uh, the importance of addressing BMSB through biological control in the urban centers bordering ag systems really can't be overstated. And that is because brown marmots stink bug have a biological advantage over samurai wasp in colder regions, in particular of the state, as it's been found that about zero degrees Fahrenheit produces 90% mortality of BMSB and samurai wasps sort of follow suit in the wild. However, the overwintering sites of BMSB in people's homes or urban dwellings protect the insect from these extreme temperatures. They produce pockets of BMSB in high numbers each year that likely move to agricultural sites throughout the season. So our research has shown the yearly recovery of samurai wasp in Western New York does demonstrate that, that the potential of this biocontrol agent for successful establishment is there. However, the sustainability of samurai wasp in Northern New York uh, definitely remains a question that we hope to answer over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, me. Peter. I, I gotta interrupt you here because we need to move on to the next speaker, but Done. like the point that the, um, homes are a kind of a host or a source for the BMSB. Yes, indeed. Thank you. So um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Long Hay. He, he is from Penn State also. Um, he, his funding is the ARDP funding through uh, USDA NEFA, and he will be talking about an intelligent spraying system for tree fruit crops pest management. I will pass it over to you, Dr. He. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Long He from Penn State. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just briefly present my um, one of our recently funded projects, 
uh, this is uh, the funding by USDA CPTM program, uh, and then started from this year, uh, I think this three year project, and then the title for this project is an intelligent spring system for tree fruit crop pest management. So we will do some technology enhancement, evaluation, and outreach um, activities. Uh, could you please uh, go to the next page? Um, so as you know that uh, recently, most of the uh, tree or orchard are using conventional um, air cluster sprayers to do the pesticide application. So based on those um, uh, sprayers, uh, that is not uh, allow us to uh, change the, the rate, the, uh, the rate. So we, uh, there are generally some problems. Um, the big problem is that we get some uh, pesticide loss. So that is, uh, is uh, influenced um, economically and also environmentally. Uh, it is very important if we could um, have uh, the technology come up with some solutions to help to limit, uh, to limit the, the loss of uh, pesticide. So as the study, I think the, the previous report from that is like only less than 30% of pesticide um, are on the target to the trees using the conventional sprayers. So that means more than 70% of the, uh, the pesticides are get lost into the, uh, the ground or drift to the air. So our study is, uh, the, part, the, the goal of our project is to introduce an intelligent sprayer to tree fruit growth and enhance the te technology to ensure the tree canopy and orchard terrains of Pennsylvania. So right now I think mainly uh, focus on Pennsylvania here. Um, so the scope of this project, including um, integration of an intelligent spraying system. So there's uh, some current uh, technology already there. So we're trying to uh, uh, adopting some of those things and integrating to our system and then to our uh, orchard conditions. And also investigate the effort, effect of orchard terrains to pest fight application, investigation of effect of tree canopy structures to the pesticide application. Uh, and also one of our other uh, tasks is to development of an autonomous orchard spray system that we're using TPS and IMU system to uh, integrating with the sprayer system for autonomous driving in the orchard. Uh, and, and last, we will also do some extension outreach activities with um, uh, oh, oh, I forgot to mention that in the team, we have one uh, plant pathology, two entomologists, and then uh, one fruit tripper indicator. And also I, I have co collaborated with an engineer from USDARS in Ohio. Ohio. Uh, could you please click to the next page? Uh, so I just have a very brief uh, kind of introduction about the, what is intended spring system here. So from the left side, you can see the overall principle of this technology. You have, we have a tree here, uh, and the canopy is in certain shape, and then we, um, when, when we're trying to apply the pesticide application, and then um, if we could get the structure of the tree canopy and the density and other information from the tree canopy, and then we can do the modeling of the tree canopy and into the, uh, using the census units to the computer control system. And then the spray assistant on the left side, you can see the nozzles it's using solenoid valves. So it's controllable, uh, the, rate, the flow rate is controllable. So we could control individual um, nozzles to spray at a certain rate and also at a certain time. So based on this, you, we could, we could um, I could, according to the sense unit, the recording date, uh, information from the tree canopy to apply our pesticide. So uh, the benefit from this is we do just spray the right amount of uh, pesticide to the right uh, to the amount, to the right location of the tree canopy. So we uh, limit limit the the waste of the can uh, the chemical to the canopy. Um, so some of the premium study we had now is uh, the first one is canopy identification. We used a um, 3D LiDAR that you can see on very small picture that we're driving that uh, small Toro vehicle uh, in the orchard. And then the sensor was mounted on the back side of the, of the, the platform. And then we're recording the point, 3D point cloud of the tree canopy structures. And then we generate those mapping uh, for the density and also for the depth of the canopy. Uh, based on those information, I think it's very good yeah, um, to um, help us to make the decision for uh, for the application of pesticide when and where and, and how long or how much we should apply uh, to the canopy. 
uh, an analyst called Rare the read control uh, that is uh, more on the nozzle side. So we have uh, each individual nozzle has some more valves to control the, uh, the opening uh, and also the timing. So, so those are the two things we're trying to integrate together to, uh, uh, to make a called intelligent spraying system and then test in the orchard. So our main goal uh, the first year, I think uh, we, we are trying to uh, integrate things in this winter. Uh, we are, right now we are purchasing some of the parts and then some of the major sensors together and then trying to in, uh, integrate them together this winter and the next spring is our first spring to uh, season to do the application. Uh, we are talking to uh, targeting to three three different um, uh, um, pesticide. Uh, no, the, the um, disease and pest. One is uh, apple scab, and the other two are uh, Japanese beetles and um, coating moth. So mainly for apples, and maybe some apply application to the peaches. Um, so uh, yeah, that's uh, all about our. So right now, just uh, started. So I don't have a lot to share. Uh, I think since well, as with this project going, we will have more uh, data and other things to share with them, uh, anybody. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for um, questions before we move on to the next speaker. I, right now, I don't see any in the Q&A, but there may be some in chat. Do people have questions for any of our speakers? So can I have a uh, ask question about like so here uh, I, I until now I think I'm the probably the only one in, the, in from engineering side so there um, so our goal is to uh, kind of helping to reduce chemical use for uh, for the pesticide management program uh, how everybody thinking about this kind of technology and that uh, in terms of research and also growers um, thoughts on this um, system. What, what kind of cost is it for the grower? Yeah, um, so for the growers, I think there's, um, uh, it's around, so the first investment probably around $30,000, I, I guess. And then, um, but there's some different uh, service there. There are some companies or private company are doing this um, uh, kind of renting service as well. Mm -hmm. So the, I, I'm not quite sure about how much, but then, um, but but this actually can save the pesticide uh, up to like 30, 50, like some people say like like 70 percent if we can do manage better job or something. So okay, so that was going to be my next question: is um, do you have much data on how much the savings would be, and that that might offset the cost and increase the interest. Long, this is Julie in New York State with Hi, IPM. Mm -hmm. So there've been uh, re there's been research on this type of system in high tunnel production mm -hmm. for raspberries, particularly in the advent of SWD. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, for some growers, this has been definitely something that they've adopted and they basically developed a system they could build it themselves in a way if they were, you know, fairly savvy with dealing with their sprayers and whatnot. And then there's also an apple grower, fairly, fairly large apple grower in New York State that tested this in their orchard. One of the questions was related to what happens with the residue that's in the lines. And I'm sorry, I had to step out for a moment. So I don't know if you mentioned what, do you have a way to clear the lines of the, the water, the, you know, the, right? Because there's gonna be the mix still in the, in the irrigation line or the, you know, the spray system. Uh. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean the lines. Um, you mean the... I mean the the spray, the black uh, uh -huh. line that goes along and over the plants that's carrying the material. Oh, uh, this one is actually, it's uh, is not, it's is just a, a movable, like it's... Um, oh. Yeah, it's not a solid... Um, kind it's of, not uh, solid set, okay. In, in, yeah. My bad. 
Thanks, Long. <laughs> yeah, I you know there, um, there is some, um, this technology actually is not new. Um, there is um, some um, system already kind of uh, used backwards, and then there's uh, some issues here and there. Uh, so our purpose actually is to deal with how we could um, actually the, as a kind of NISA based sensor to use in either kind of slope like hilly terrain and also right now the tree, different tree architectures. So those are two major concerns we have like how to um, measure the tree canopy structure, uh, especially the volume, the shape and density. Um, and then also the terrain issues, like what, how to kind of uh, compensate different terrain into uh, when you're applying those, this kind of technologies. So those are two things that we are uh, kind of focused on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to our next presentation um, by Dr. Sam Anderson, <laughs> Cornell Cooperative Extension. His funding is from Northeast SARE, and he's, uh, he'll, as you see, we'll be talking about she spotted spider mite IPM for urban agriculture. So I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the last correction I want to make, but I'm not a doctor, but I will just let that one slide. Um, <laughs> I I'm just a, promoted you. I, let's just, yeah, let's just leave it at that. That's great. Um, so I'm, a, yeah, my name is Sam Anderson. I'm an urban agriculture specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, based in New York City. Um, there are two of us, myself and, and uh, Yolanda Gonzalez, who work with commercial urban farms at over 40 different sites around the city. <clears throat> uh, we work mainly with a mix of for-profit and non-profit operations that are selling some or all of what they grow. So basically anyone growing at a market scale. Um, so some of them are hydroponic, but most are growing in soil very often constructed soils with a lot of organic matter. And the majority of these are diversified vegetable operations, uh, which means that there are at least 30 urban farms that we've visited so far, which are growing and selling tomatoes. And tomatoes tend to be uh, a, a fairly important crop at, at most of these sites. <laughs> um, so the, and, and the biggest pest um, or disease challenge we've seen, the most widespread and the most overall damaging in the city has been two spotted spider mite on tomatoes. Um, and so that raises some interesting questions about um, why it's such an issue here uh, when it's, it seems to be a much bigger issue here than it is um, just outside the city or elsewhere in the region um, besides in greenhouse production. And uh, uh, so whether it's related to the urban heat ion effect or possibly a lack of natural enemies present in the environment here. Um, there, uh, another sort of factor in figuring out how to address it is that there's a strong uh, preference among pretty much all urban farmers here for organic and uh, organic controls and, and actually for cultural controls, avoiding spraying anything. Um, and questions about whether spraying is, is right, um, even uh, horticultural soaps and things isn't always going to work on some of these sites. So. Uh, that means that it's important to find um, IPM solutions. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so with that in mind, I um, wrote this SARE partnership grant, um, which work is, we started work just this year. Uh, and the idea is to put in place a scouting protocol, um, which includes putting bean plants, so bush bean plants at row ends and, and strategically in rows. Um, to use as an early warning um, uh, for scouting to train farm managers and crew uh, how to scout for spider mites on, on beans and tomatoes and to help them put a scouting protocol in place. This is something that's not uh, commonly the case on, uh, well, it's not the case on almost any of the urban farms. In fact, uh, in general, a lot of places haven't, um, a lot of the urban farmers are not used to the idea of spider mites and because of growing uh, their experience being somewhere where they weren't really an issue. So um, most farms um, we found didn't didn't have any real, it didn't have anything they were really doing about spider mite and often didn't realize they had it. Um, and so releasing, the, so, so the first part is, yeah, scouting protocol. Um, and that'll be in collaboration with Elizabeth Lamb from the New York State IPM program. 
Uh, the next part is uh, biocontrols, so releasing some biocontrols, uh, phalaces, uh, Faltiella, Karasuga as, uh, as early sort of preventative um, release and uh, persimilis as needed in response to the scouting, um, to the thresholds we set in scouting with the, uh, with the farmers. And, um, and that's collaborating with Carol Glenister of IPM Labs. And the third part is uh, establishing habitat plantings for attracting and maintaining natural enemies. Um, that's in collaboration with Amara Dunn from the New York State IPM program. And an interesting sort of question out of that is whether or not any of the introduced beneficials might be able to overwinter in the city, um, possibly because of the urban heat island effect um, might make it easier. Not, not for Persimilis, which we know won't overwinter, but maybe Phalaces or Feltiella could pull it off because um, winter nights are a lot warmer here than they are just outside the city. So that's the really fast five minute, five minute presentation. Thank you. And Right at the end, you answered my question about how well do the biocontrols overwinter? Yeah, well, we don't know, but that's one of the things we're hoping to find out. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Morgan Thompson, Maryland, and uh, the funding is from Norton Sayre. The presentation you'll see is on the um, effect on biological nitrogen fixation in alfalfa. And I will pass it over to you. All right, great. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Morgan Thompson, and I just finished up my master's actually at the University of Maryland working with Dr. Bill Lamp. Um, and I'm now a PhD student at Texas A&M working with Dr. Angel Helms. Um, and I, uh, at the University of Maryland, received some funding from Northeast Sare um, to study uh, the effect of potato leaf hopper feeding on biological nitrogen fixation in alfalfa. And so I want to share some of those results with you all today. Um, so uh, first I just kind of want to begin my talk by thinking about um, uh, leaf hoppers. Um, so potato leaf hoppers are a particularly devastating pest of alfalfa in the Northeast, um, and that's for a few different reasons. The main reasons are that uh, leaf hoppers are migratory, so they come up from the southern United States every year into the northeastern United States. They're also multivoltine and they're highly polyphagous, so they have lots of different host plants that they can feed on, uh, which makes them very difficult to, to manage, and they're a particularly devastating pest of alfalfa. Um, and so uh, I also just kind of want to step through some of the interactions of alfalfa with their microbial symbionts, uh, rhizobia. Uh, and so uh, first, when, when we're thinking about an alfalfa plant um, and uh, we're thinking about when these plants are photosynthesizing as a nitrogen fixing plant, what they're doing with most of those products of photosynthesis or uh, fixed carbon, as I have it shown here as C fixed, um, is that they're translocating that carbon to the roots of the plants um, to feed the nitrogen fixing bacteria that are actually living inside the root nodules of these plants, as I have shown here. Um, and then what those nitrogen fixing bacteria are doing is they're extracting inert nitrogen gas from the atmosphere. So they're actually breaking apart the triple bond between um, uh, an N2 uh, molecule and converting this into um, ammonium, which the plants take up as fixed nitrogen. Um, and so this is how this interaction um, typically occurs, but we do know uh, that leafhopper feeding uh, does impact uh, some of this interaction. Uh, so if you could just click, when we have leafhopper uh, feeding and damage on alfalfa plants, uh, we know a few things happen. Um, so if you could click, we know that photosynthesis is reduced in these plants um, when the plants are fed on by leafhoppers. And if you could click one more time, we also know um, that uh, the translocation of fixed carbon is also reduced in alfalfa plants that are fed on by leafhoppers. Um, and if you could click for me one more time. But then what we didn't know going into my master's project was how this impacts nitrogen fixation in alfalfa. Um, and so, so that was really the focus of my master's work was trying to understand how leafhopper feeding affects this below ground interaction in the plants. Um, and so we were also interested in this, um, not necessarily as uh, how uh, fixation is happening below ground, but then how the plants are moving these products of nitrogen fixation uh, both below and above ground in alfalfa plants. 
Um, and so we looked at this interaction in both the field and the greenhouse. And so today I just want to step through uh, some of the, the cool findings um, from this work. So if you could just click for me. Uh, so here on the left, I'm showing the results um, from our field experiment last summer. So in the summer of 2018. Um, and so I'm showing fixed nitrogen biomass on the y-axis. And then we also looked at these interactions across different levels of soil nitrate. Um, to understand how uh, the soil nutrients modify these interactions uh, between plant and insect. Um, and so here in our field experiment, we actually found significant effects um, across our two soil nitrogen treatments. Um, and at our moderate nitrate treatments, we saw very little nitrogen fixation regardless of leafhopper feeding. Whereas at our no nitrogen treatment, we saw um, an increase actually in fixed biomass nitrogen biomass. Um, oh, and uh, sorry, what I forgot to mention was that for the field experiment here, I'm presenting our results on the uh, fixed biomass accumulation of the shoots. Um, so these are, this is the above ground portion of the plants. Um, so those fed on by leafhoppers actually had greater amounts of fixed nitrogen biomass above ground. Um, and then when we look to our greenhouse experiment on the right, we saw very similar results, but when we added in a high nitrate treatment, we actually saw recovery of nitrogen fixation at that high soil nitrogen level, um, but contrasting effects of leafhopper feeding. Um, and so I think the big takeaway message for IPM or for growers of any type of nitrogen fixing crop is that depending on your soil nutrient environment and potentially the pest involved, you could have very different effects on how fixed nitrogen accumulates um, in your crop. Um, and so with that, I would be happy to take any questions, um, but I do have to run to class um, in a few minutes here, so I will have to sign off, but thank you all so much for allowing me to participate, um, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any questions for you just yet, but if we get any in writing, we'll send them on to you. Great, thank you. So our next speaker um, is Dr. Christina Rosa from Penn State and her funding again is ARDP from USDA NEFA and she's looking at nanotube technologies to enhance crop protection from houseboat viruses and other unculturable pathogens. So I will pass it right over to you. Thank you. Um, so, so nice being here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so the project we were working on was looking at how tospoviruses can infect seedlings of tomato. And in seedlings in tomatoes, tospovirus infections sometimes are not really well developed. And so uh, growers risk to plant uh, seedlings that are already infected in their fields. Um, so we were looking at the coupling regular uh, methodologies for detection of viruses with a new technology that was developed here at Penn State by one of my colleagues, Mauricio Terrones in physics. He created these nanotube devices uh, that he wanted to use for screening viruses. And so we decided to adapt these devices for use in agriculture. Um, so as you can see here is uh, my student on the left uh, in uh, California collecting uh, tospovirus infected tomatoes in the field. And then uh, the procedure we used was to uh, take these tissues, macerate them in bags. Uh, you can look at the picture in the middle and it's number one. Um, we had to pre-filter the uh, tissues macerated to remove the biggest debris in number two. And then we were attaching the uh, syringes that we use for the filtrate uh, directly to these nano devices and uh, the nano devices are depicted in a cartoon form in number three. Uh, those are 1.1 centimeters in size uh, and they are made out of uh, carbon nanotubes forest enclosed in a kind of a little capsule of a different type of material. So the flow through is passed through these devices and is collected on the other side through these uh, um, portals that you see attached in number three. Uh, so the last picture on the right shows uh, the principle of, uh, behind the entrapment of viruses in the nano devices. Uh, so inside the nano devices, there are these forests of microfiber or nanocarbon, and the particles are trapped by size. 
uh, these devices usually do not clog very easily and they are uh, protected by a PDMS filter uh, on top and the bottom. Uh, so all the contaminants will uh, collect through uh, the device and go into the door tubes, while the viruses will uh, stay inside the nanoforest. And then uh, uh, we can capture them in the nanoforest, extract them and subject them to ELISA, real-time PCR or other techniques. Uh, do you mind moving the slide forward? Thank you. So I just wanted to show you a couple of results from our study. Uh, the devices can be open and put directly under transmission electron microscopes. So, so the top picture on the left uh, shows the microtube fiber or nano devices open. And what you can see, those spaghetti type are the uh, carbon nanoforest. And then we use a uh, blue coloration to show particles of uh, um, tospoviruses trapped directly into the forest. And so you can visualize them directly into the uh, transmission electron microscope. On the right, uh, on the top, you can use a, um, a real-time PCR to measure what you had originally in your sample, what the trapped barriers, viruses inside the devices, and also what remains in the flow through after you pass the sample through the devices. And so we perform different dilutions, and what you have to pay attention is the uh, orange bar um, that basically is what we trapped inside the devices. So a very low dilution of the samples, uh, we trap and we can detect by real-time PCR only virions inside the devices, and we cannot even detect them in the original tissues or in the outrope. Uh, also, we use these uh, um, collected devices to look at uh, enrichment uh, from, for um, high throughput sequencing, and we were looking at depletion of the host that should pass through devices and uh, should be uh, reduced for uh, HTS. And in fact, if you look at the different sizes of nanotubes, if you look at the trap bar uh, virions, sometimes we have, uh, uh, depending on the devices that we use, we have different enrichment. Uh, so the take home message is that uh, these uh, um, nano devices can be used to concentrate viruses and then they can be used for different methodologies for uh, tospovirus detection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we will move on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Sarah, Sarah Petherbridge from here. And she is, she has funding through ARDP with USDA NEPA. And she's looking at a durable management strategy for leaf spot and table beet. I'll pass it right on to you. Thanks, Deb. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about our project funded by USDA NEFA's ARDP program, looking at the durable management strategies for an important disease of table beets called Cercospora leaf spot. As Deb mentioned, I'm a plant pathologist based at Cornell Agritech in Geneva, and primarily I work with the broadacre vegetable cropping systems, and table beet is one of my um, primary commodities. So this project is a collaborative project, multi-state, between myself and Julie Kickert, who's from Cornell Cooperative Extension's Regional Vegetable Team here in New York, and Linda Hansen, who's from the USDA ARS in Michigan, and Linda is a sugar beet pathologist in Michigan. So Cospera leaf spot is the major disease affecting table beet production in New York. It causes um, reduction in green leaf area, a bit reduced ability for the plants to shift carbohydrates to the roots, reducing and reduced, resulting in reduced root weight and reduced root quality. But it's most important because we rely upon top pulling machinery to harvest our crops. So that's machinery that goes under the leaves, pulls the crop out of the ground from the leaves. So we need green integritous leaves for that process to be conducted. One of the major issues in managing this disease is fungicide resistance. So currently our fungicide applications are made throughout the season without regard to risk. And we know that we have a, a prevalence of resistance to FRAC group 11, the strobilorin fungicides, and we also have resistance to FRAC group 3 as well. 
So we were looking at alternative ways to get around this prophylactic calendar fungicide application strategies because we're, we're risk averse, um, trying to get away from complete crop loss. But this forecast has been developed for this disease. It's called Endorn, and it was developed for the disease in sugar beet in North Dakota. And what we've been doing over the last two years is looking at the utility of these forecasting models compared to our calendar applications um, for the control of this disease and any effect on yield components, but also trying to roll out what we can do to be able to implement these models as well. Looking at disease action thresholds, when do we actually start the first application? Can we wait for 10 lesions per leaf? Can we wait for one lesion per leaf? And developing practical sequential sampling models um, so when you go into a field, how, do you, how many samples do you look at to assess that action threshold? And what, when, what spatial distribution do you walk to be able to accurately assess that in the field? So if you go to the next slide. So I can give you some results um, so far. For our forecasting experiments, again, we've done nine different replicated experiments at several different locations. We've been able to reduce the number of sprays to one or two per season compared to the four that's normally done with calendar applications. And we've been able to refine the action threshold also dependent upon the fungicide mode of action that we're using. We've been able to also define that action threshold with different products. Um, for example, if we're going to use Miravis top, we can wait for a bit longer with up to 10 lesions per leaf and we may be able to therefore reduce sprays within the season as well by taking that differential fungicide efficacy into account. And we've also been able to develop that sequential sampling plan. We know that we need to evaluate 50 to 55 leaves at a scale of two metres between the samples to make those correct decisions in at least 95% of cases. So moving forward, our end dawn forecasting system is compatible with newer. It's running offline at the moment, but we've got some specialty crop block grant funding to be able to move this into on-farm trials for the next two years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we have some, we have some time for questions. So if you do have any questions, please either type them in the Q&A or if you're a presenter, you'll have to type them into the chat. Um, we have one question for uh, Sam Anderson. Um, why Persimilis later? From what I have seen, Persimilis is extremely effective for cheap. Yeah, so we wanted to, partly because we wanted to try a few different biocontrols, um, uh, just to, for the sake of trying them out and seeing what works, because the only ones that had, we knew of having actually been tried in, in, on urban farms here uh, was one farm had tried Persimilis um, twice, and both times felt like it didn't work that well, maybe because it was released too late. So pr with Persimilis, our, our idea is, um, to release it in response to a thresh when a threshold is met in through the scouting program and that again really the biggest part of this whole uh, grant is is education and so having that um, being able to walk through that process with farmers of when scouting at, at a certain scouting threshold take action uh, and persimilis being a really good knockdown option or supposed to be definitely in greenhouses it's, it's very well proven um, with the others, the other thing is that with Persimilis, we knew, um, well, it, it's, my understanding has been that it's not ideal as a, um, if you use it too far in advance because it needs to spot a spider mite or it needs spider mites um, to persist. And that because it, we know it won't, um, is it really unlikely to persist over the winter. We wanted to try the other two places and Beltiella to see if either of them would persist over the winter. So. That's basically the idea. But we'll try the other ones first and they can be more of a preventative measure. Persimilis will be part of that process of walking through the farmers. When you reach a certain scouting threshold, what action can you take? Um, that's, that's sort of the short answer. Okay, thank you. 
I don't see other questions right now. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and move on if Dr. Iso is prepared. Um, yep, I'm, I'm here. Okay, so he's from the University of Vermont Plant and Soil Science Department. His funding is Northeast SARE, and um, he'll be talking about pre and post harvest strategies for moth control on vegetable farms. I'll pass it right over to you. Um, well, thanks you very much, um, Deb. So, uh, originally the idea was to talk about the pre and post harvest um, SARE grant, but that SARE grant just started this past March and it's actually a continuation of a project that's been going on since the recent invasion of the leek moth um, Acrolepiopsis acetella into Vermont um, around 2009. And currently all the, the research that we did for that SARE grant, which was looking at kind of parasitoid wasps and their effect on the um, onion harvest and eventually the post harvest handling whereby we're cutting onions at different lengths, we're topping them at different lengths to reduce the likelihood that there will be any um, larvae that get brought into curing conditions and then creating marketable damage into the bulbs. Currently, all those things are in storage because we wanted to see how long they would store. So we don't have necessarily data for that. But I found, I, I think it'd be um, actually more important to talk about the research that we did leading up to it. Um, and that is part of kind of like a partner research with that with that grant. And so, like uh, Deb said, I'm because I'm from the University of Vermont and I am a lecturer here at, in the Plant and Soil Science Department. And I work as part of a collaborative known as the Agroecology and Livelihoods Collaborative, where we kind of take a transdisciplinary uh, perspective on research, specifically as we work with farmers. So we also use a participatory action research to do all of our work. So all of the questions that we've, we've developed here at the ALC have been developed in conjunction with all of our farmers. Every single year, um, twice a year, we have meetings with about 15 farmers within the region, and we develop actually hypotheses around specific types of pests, um, both kind of in agronomic crops, but also sometimes um, we talk about some pests that are associated with, with fruit crops. Um, anyhow, so one of those questions came up with, with this invasion of leek moth that happened in uh, 2009. You can switch to the next uh, slide there. Please. So um, the distribution of the, the current distribution of leek moth in the Northeast um, began kind of with an invasion through Ontario. Interesting enough, two of our worst pests that have come into the Vermont area are the sweet midge, which affects brassicas, and leek moth, which affects all of our alliums, occurred via Ontario, I mean via uh, Quebec, um, coming from the north and moving down south into um, the Northeast. And so leek moth particularly is a pest of all alliums. It's particularly a problem in leeks, hence the name leek moth. Um, basically, it's rendered the entire uh, industry around leek. Any growers that are growing leek um, organically here in Vermont, basically, you can't really grow them. Um, infestation pretty happened pretty quickly. Uh, leek moth emerge in the early spring, lay eggs May through June in the first flight, and basically decimate all alliums specifically leeks, like I said, and especially shallots. And so a lot of growers were worried about this pest around onions. Um, there's a large number of growers in our region that, that um, basically shoulder a lot of their um, late season revenue on root crops and bulb crops like onions. And so it was, it was kind of important. And so what we did was for this trial, we had a couple questions that we wanted to answer. The first question was, how can monitoring help to implement certain IPM uh, tactics? Uh, it's really important to identify when specific flights are happening, especially with lepidopteran pests. And so identifying when would be the best time to implement any type of, whether it's a chemical control or in some cases a cultural control like exclusion netting if you were able to cover all of your onions um, at a certain scale. And then finally looking at different varieties of onions and seeing if there was any uh, variability and susceptibility to leek moth. And like I said before, the big concern, of course, were garlic and onions. And garlic, it seems, that isn't a huge issue currently with the current invasion, primarily because you're pulling garlic out relatively early when the leek moth, the second flight of leek moth, has really reached its, its largest population size. And so the largest impact comes from the second flight, which generally occurs sometime in, 
in July and, and August. So that, that the concern around, around uh, garlic isn't that huge of a deal. Basically what the, the gmot does, it lays its eggs on the top part of the, the onion or the allium, and then they develop and they never actually go into the ground unless there's been dieback from the above leaf tubes. And so really what we did was we decided, well, is there any, because onions are harvested in, in August and there's a potential that you might get some bulb damage when those larvae move down um, after dieback happens in the leaf tubes. We looked at different varietal um, uh, differences in susceptibility. And that's the, on the right hand side here is our um, data on our varietal trials. And basically we looked at red and yellow onions and we planted them kind of in a checkerboard format um, right next to each other. And as you can see here that on the left hand side, Red onions are significantly less susceptible than yellow onions. Um, and then also, interestingly enough, that there was more damage in larger onions than in smaller onions. Um, and that, that kind of, um, our hypothesis is not that the leaf moth is leading to some sort of vegetative compensation or biomass compensation. It's actually that they are, these are nocturnal flying um, moths. So they're probably locating their, their host based upon volatiles that are coming off the plant. And those volatiles are probably coming off in higher concentrations from um, larger bulbs or more healthy onions. And so that's why we're seeing that effect. So red onions, less susceptible, and your healthier, bigger onions are probably gonna get hit first um, before those leaf moths start to lay eggs on smaller onions. So that's around, it looks like I'm out of time too. So I guess that's about it if there's any questions. Thank you. Um, I think we'll keep moving along. I don't, unless there, Unless there are questions from presenters, I think we'll continue moving along. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Julie Benazuski from Penn State. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, her funding is from Northeast SARE, and she's looking at do polycultures increase ecosystem services of arthropod predators? So I'll pass it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, I apologize for the background noise. Um, there seems to be a lot of landscaping going on. Um, so my research interests are um, in involving how crop species diversity influence ecosystem services, um, specifically those of natural enemies. Um, and so my main question is, is looking at how increasing the number of crop species grown together can first increase productivity, um, but also uh, increase the arthropod diversity, um, including uh, predators. Uh, click. Um, and so first looking at productivity, um, I sort of defined the concept as, as two different principles. Um, click. The first being um, biomass um, and click. The second being economics. Um, so what we did is we grew uh, single species of corn, sorghum, or soybeans. Click. Um, and then we have two species of corn and sorghum, uh, as well as corn and soybeans, click. And then finally, we have a four species mixture, uh, grown in polyculture of corn, sorghum, soybeans, and sunflower, um, click. And so to first emphasize the biomass production, um, we wanted to see if, if one of these species was sort of a superior competitor and outdid all the other um, species, um, or if they sort of worked together and sort of complemented each other, um, utilizing the resources available and grew better, um, more biomass when grown together. Click. And so what we found was corn was actually a superior competitor, whether grown in monoculture or grown in polyculture with these other species. Um, corn produced the most biomass. Um, sorghum by itself or uh, soybeans by itself grew a lot less um, biomass production than some of the other crop species. Click. Um, looking at economics, however, we found that there's no significant difference between the different species grown together. Uh, click. And so they were all, all equal. Um, they sort of com complemented each other more so um, based on the value um, as well as the biomass production. Um, so the species such as sunflower or soybeans that were higher value commodities, um, although they produced less biomass, when we look at the value of the, the species grown together, um, there's no significant difference. So they, they sort of um, complemented um, the biomass production side. Click. Um, and so I wanna move on to the arthropod diversity um, and predation side of, of this project. Um, click. 
And so what we did is we applied a split plot with insecticides. So we had a control that had no chemical spray, and then we had a split plot or half the plot with a warrior insecticide. Um, click. And what we found was that diversity in the arthropod community, there's no, no clear trend. So we expected sort of a linear trend that by increasing the number of crop species grown together, we'd see the same increase in, in diversity. Um, the four species mixture had a, a little bit higher um, of the, the diversity, but there's um, similar amounts in, in the soybean only plots. So there's no linear trend um, that we could see. The predation, as we would expect, was a lot higher in the control plots compared to the spray plots. Um, there's a, a large difference in both the ground and the foliar um, predation rates. Click. Click. Um, and so what I'm showing here is, is the foliar predation. Uh, we glued aphids to index cards and put them in the foliage. And then we counted um, the amount of aphids consumed at three hours, six hours, and then finally at 24 hours. And so what you're seeing on the horizontal axis here is the different mixtures as well as the different um, split plots, the control or the insecticide. And you see at three hours here, uh, the control plots had much higher rates of predation compared to the sprayed plots. The only uh, soybean plots were the only ones that were sort of funky, um, as you can see the, the insecticide um, predation rates. Um, but there's almost no predation uh, in the insecticide sprayed plots indicating that the predators don't really take refuge in these sprayed plots. We were observing this for up to three weeks after the spray, so quite a bit of time after the insecticides were applied. Click. And then finally here, you see foliar predation at 24 hours. Uh, and so this is consecutive predation, um, and you see an increase in the controlled plots as well as the sprayed plots um, throughout all the, the mixtures. There's a little bit of a difference. You can see corn bee and, and the big mix have quite high rates of predation in the, in the control. Uh, some of the insecticide sprayed plots have a little bit higher predation. The corn A plots still have almost no predation as well as the sorghum plots, um, at, even at 24 hours. And so we see a little bit of a, a difference, but no, no clear trend with the, um, the interaction of the, control, the, the chemical spray as well as the, the polyculture system. Uh, and so overall, we had really low press pressures in the system and high diversity. Um, so I think a lot of what we expected to see was washed out based on the system we were using. Uh, but in conclusion, we didn't, really we didn't really see that the polyculture or the increasing species diversity per se actually increased the eco ecosystem services of the natural enemies. Um, rather, it was the chemicals um, applied, the chemical insecticide, that had a much bigger impact on the predator communities. Um, and it also highlights the idea that refuge areas are, are really important, especially if, if chemicals are applied, um, because natural enemies are mobile and they can still provide benefits to agricultural systems um, when insecticides are, are required. Uh, so kind of to wrap up here, um, polycultures per se don't necessarily increase the ecosystem services of natural enemies in the system. Um, chemicals can definitely impede the, the natural enemies. Um, and I think this might, we might be able to see a little bit more um, if we were to move to a system that had a little bit more um, stress pressures, especially with, with the um, insect pests. Um, and so I'll kind of wrap up there or if I have any time for questions. We do have time for questions. If there, um, if people have questions, there's a uh, the Q and A, and presenters can use the chat or or voice. And at right now, I want to also add that um, for the for the attendees, we will be sending an an evaluation after the um, webinar is over, and we hope you'll respond to that. It helps us plan them in the future and also helps us in reporting. And then we also will email a link of the recorded webinar about in about a week to everyone, presenters and attendees. So you can watch for that. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. There is one question in the chat though. Um, Victor, so do you wanna ask that question out loud or do you want me to read it? Um, I can, I can oh, go ahead. Oh, you, can, you can see, I can ask that. So just basically, I was just wondering if you took into account the cost of land, right? So if you're growing 
many different um, uh, crops in a single piece of land that frees up that other land to grow more crops. No, we we didn't consider um, we didn't consider that we had sort of a variable cost um, analysis, so we didn't actually consider the the land cost um, in this. Just the the variable cost, the the chemicals, um, the machinery, the fuel, and um, uh, profit from each each of the crop species. So the crop species were harvested um, separately and accounted separately. So presumably, if it's equal across all, then if you conclude the land, it would actually be positive in the polyculture. Is that a good conclusion? Or? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be something to look into. That's great. Will you be at NSOC? I'm, I'm curious to see. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we'll have probably a little time at the end for some more questions. But right now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Shannon Sked from uh, Rutgers in New Jersey. And her funding is Northeast IPM Center. Um, she'll talking about the movement of house mouse in multifamily dwellings. So uh, I actually, uh, I'm a PhD student in Chang Lu's lab. Um, but it, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about the house mouse in low income multifamily environments. If you could move on to the next slide, please. So there were three major objectives of this. Um, and the first one was to actually evaluate uh, the accuracy of residential complaints for house mice compared to what we actually find during a building-wide evaluation. Um, that part of the project was completed in two replicates so far. We still have a third replicate to complete. And so far with the two replicates, what we found is, is pretty overwhelmingly um, it is, it's not an accurate way to determine whether or not there are mice infestations in apartments. However, unlike some of the other spatial analysis that we've done with other urban pests, uh, with house mice, it's actually the false positives um, that are the highest rather than the false negatives. Uh, so it's a little bit of an inverse and that might have to do with uh, stigma associated with other pests such as bed bugs compared to house mice. Um, the second one was to, the second objective was to compare the preference of commercially available baits to mice. And also we, we actually included um, palatability using a non-bait product as well. It's a chocolate spread. Um, and then the third one was to investigate in apartment spatial preference of mice. So for the second objective, what we did find is there, there actually is a preference on baits um, where one bait was, was obviously more preferred than the other one. Uh, we had very, very low feeding on just the uh, uh, contract block. If the contract block was fed, the other bait, which was first strike, was also fed as well. Um, so there, and these were all soft baits. None of them were the block baits. So we didn't have to deal with the bait avoidance for block and wax. Um, however, when we compared that to the chocolate spread, the chocolate spread was, was uh, overwhelmingly the preferred palatable uh, substance that they were feeding upon. So there, there's something more to investigate there, and it, there is an implication, which I'll get to a little bit. The, for the third objective, the in-apartment spatial preference, we actually placed these bait boxes in three different locations in the apartment. Um, it was either near the sink, near the stove, or over by wherever, whatever the HVAC system was, uh, so the heating and ventilation system. And um, so far in the two buildings, we had one building that had a baseboard heating system with a hot water pipe, and the other building was a encapsulated forced hot air ductwork system. And what we found was it was very different between those two buildings. In the one that had the encapsulated ductwork forced hot air system, um, the stove was where we saw most of it, and there was a, a significant difference there. However, in the, in the building where there was the baseboard system, um, there was an egress uh, capability that the mice could use. And because of that, we actually saw that it was about split between the stove and the um, HVAC system, in this case, the baseboard system. So there's the, the movement is actually really dependent on the construction, um, which is one of the takeaways that we got from there. Uh, if you could click next, please. The last piece that I'm doing with this is actually looking at spatial analysis over time um, using mapping system uh, where we're actually identifying by bait, by location. So it's instead of it just being an in-apartment in apartment spatial analysis, it's actually a building-wide spatial analysis. And I'm still in the middle of doing this work, but what we're seeing so far with early observations is 
there's a lot of movement and actually a lot of the commercially available baits, which are not just used to control rodent activity, but also used for monitoring, are actually kind of falling off after a period of time. And we're still seeing activity in, in areas using just the chocolate. Um, so there's, there's, there's more to actually come with this. And I'm really interested in seeing how this all pans out, especially after we get the third replicate. Overall, the major findings that we found was that resident complaints are not accurate indicators of mouse infestations. But again, unlike the other urban pests that we've done some of the similar work on, what we're finding is it's actually the false positives where they're saying, yes, I have mice, but actually we're not finding mice. That's actually the cause of the error. Uh, number two, mice display preference to bait sources. So there is a difference in palatability for commercially available baits. And actually there's more palatability work that probably needs to be done because we're finding other products outside of the commercial baits that are even more palatable than the bait products. And then commercial baits may not be reliable for, for determining full elimination. The fact that we're still getting bait feeding on the chocolate spread after they stop feeding on the baits tells me that the concern I have for this in the industry is if you're using, if a pest control operator is using uh, bait systems to try to determine whether or not rodent activity is eliminated, and they're stop feeding on the baits, well, if we don't have something else that's more palatable to them, you could erroneously say there is no activity when actually there is some activity still in the apartment building. And then last, the apartment locations of activity. So for the in-apartment uh, spatial analysis, it's really dependent on the construction. So having an understanding on the way that the apartments are set up and the construction of the building is um, really important for understanding where to put uh, uh, management tactics within apartment apartments within a complex. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to. Thank you. Um, I have one question. How do I, why false positive, I have mice when I don't have mice. I, I, I'm baffled by that. Why would they do that? <laughs> so I think what it is is that they, with uh, some of the other, um, especially bed bugs in, in, in low income communities, what we see is a lot of times people are very concerned about bringing it up because there is such a stigma associated with it. And often they're afraid of, of, of consequences such as losing their section eight voucher or management blaming them for the issue. Whereas with mice, I think most of the residents from the interviews that I've done, most of the residents actually see it more of a building management problem and not their problem. So they're more willing to say, yeah, I got a problem, do something to help me, because they're not seeing it as it, it's caused by them. They're seeing it caused by the property management group. Interesting. Although you wonder if the, they don't get their primary problem addressed. That is true. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you. If we get more questions, we'll bring those up at the end or send them out to people. So our last speaker, last but not least, is um, Dr. Mei Jun Hu from University of Maryland. Um, the funding is from the Northeastern IPM Center and it's on development of a microclimate sensor-based tool for strawberry disease forecasting. Okay. Pass it over to you. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction. So. Um, um, my name is Meng Jun Hu. Um, based at um, work at the University of Maryland. Is it, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Yes. So uh, with this project, so we wanted to um, actually develop a tool uh, that allows us to monitor disease infection, uh, of course, in real time uh, through microclimate-based sensors for strawberry production. Um, botrytis grimos and anthracos are two major diseases that oftentimes drive the fungus applications. Um, so growers typically spray um, for those diseases on a weekly basis. Um, with the capability of monitoring disease infection, we can uh, hopefully better time uh, fungus application to avoid unnecessary sprays. So as some of you may know that there have been uh, some uh, a few similar disease monitoring systems uh, that have already been developed. Um, so unlike other systems that rely on weather stations, we place sensors directly into the strawberry canopy. And um, to grow strawberry in many areas in the country, and we have to use row covers to cover the entire field 
to protect berries from um, um, winter damage and the frost um, during uh, early spring as well. Our hypothesis is that uh, microclimate will be altered with row covers resulting disease infection events that may not be uh, picked up by weather stations. Uh, on the other hand, we believe that the canopy level sensor can improve the data precision, which in turn may improve the precision of disease uh, uh, forecasting. So we're working with AgZoom, which is a uh, company that specialized in uh, sensor data visualization and model integration to support, uh, to support the sensor-based systems. Uh, users can log in uh, to see the real-time data through the app on their phones, um, tablets, and the computers as well. So where we are right now with this project, um, we have set up uh, the sensors and the weather stations in our research fields and the growers fields, uh, where we will evaluate the efficacy of the tool uh, for disease control. And the sensors and the weather stations have been uh, uh, connected uh, with the AgZoom's uh, platform, as shown on the on the picture at the bottom left, uh, where we have uh, we'll have uh, three uh, different sites uh, where we're gonna, uh, where we're gonna do the efficacy trials, and we also um, just finished planting berries in our research farm early this month, and the pictures on the on the right, and the pictures at the bottom right. Our weather stations and the sensors, um, uh, we are uh, installing them. You can say that the weather station is about six feet, seven feet above the ground, or whereas the sensor is directly placed into the canopy. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So here is an uh, example of the data and um, a model outputs. So the first chart shows you the temperature and the leaf wetness from both sensors and uh, weather stations. We have now successfully integrated both botrytis and anthracnose disease models into the AgZoom platform. The two charts below, uh, one is botrytis, the other is the anthracnose model. Um, so the y-axis is the disease index that tells you the risk of disease infection. The higher the index is, the more risk you have for this disease infection. Um, you can say that the infection risk actually uh, correlates pretty well with the wetness duration in the first chart. Those uh, greenish blue peaks represent wetness as a result of uh, rainfall in most cases, but in some cases uh, can be a result of uh, dew water as well. So when spring comes, we're going to use this tool to time our fungus applications in the field um, and compare that with the grower standard uh, sprays and uh, uh, with the Anfa weather station based uh, forecasting systems as well. Um, um, if you are interested in this, um, so uh, feel free to uh, contact me. I included my uh, contact information. I should have also mentioned that, um, uh, should I have also included the contact information of my colleague and also uh, the collaborator uh, on this project, Dr. John Lee Cox uh, at the University of Maryland. So, John takes care of everything related to the sensors. So I'm in charge of um, uh, disease-related uh, trials, efficacy trials. So that's all I have for today, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe you said this, but I missed it. Where do you, where does the weather data come from? What do you use for your weather data? Oh, we have um, we have weather stations. If you go to the first slide, uh, we have weather stations and the sensors both installed in the field. Okay, so it's your own uh, very local site-specific weather. Correct. And are, will you at some point um, say use grid weather? I don't I think a lot of farmers. Yes. Uh, the weather data. Yeah, so we are uh, um, um, we install the sensors and the weather stations both in the same field, and we're gonna compare the the difference in terms of you know the, the data difference from the weather station and from the sensors, and um, and the, and understand whether the difference would be translated would it translate into disease difference, and so we're gonna do uh, efficacy trials with the data as well. 
Um, yes, it's a uh, site specific, um, you know, the, the weather station and sensor are uh, site specific uh, because the weather conditions can be uh, very variable. Um, um, even a couple miles down the road, sometimes the, um, the NIF wetness and the temperature could be different and that could uh, lead to the difference in disease monitoring. Um, did, I, did I answer your question? You did, thank you. Um, you might ultimately want to be in touch with Juliet Carroll at New York State IPM and with Glenn Kaler at University of Maine, but yeah. you know later on in your research anyway. If you want those introductions, I'd be happy to make them. Oh uh, yeah, we all. I mean, I I I, I know uh, Juliet and yeah, uh, yeah. I was <laughs> I was just gonna say Deb. Yeah. Um, like well, is yeah. Yes, well, um, so just to, um, if I have a few more minutes, I, I wanted to uh, give a background information about this project. And this actually is the outcome of uh, another project that I was uh, working on, uh, where I implement the Florida uh, Strawberry Advisory System in the Mid-Atlantic. So uh, we have done some trials in Virginia, uh, Maryland, with the SAS um, uh, system, and which is a weather station-based system. and uh, the data from those trials uh, was not very consistent. Some, are, some of the trials are okay, some of them are not um, what we would uh, expect. Uh, um, so, um, what our hypothesis is that because uh, uh, in Florida they don't use uh, road covers to grow strawberries. In California they don't use road covers, but in many areas in this country they do use road covers that will change the microclimate, the plant microclimate, which is not, I mean, the, which is not, um, um, you know, the weather stations are not capable of monitoring those plant microclimates on the road covers. Uh, and that's why we um, uh, were doing this, come up with this idea to monitor the microclimate um, on the road covers, with or without road covers, and compare that with, um, uh, with the weather station based, based uh, forecasting system. So that's way, um, you know, that's a little background information. So. Meng Jun, I have a question about the row covers. Do you mean floating row covers or do you mean the low tunnels yes. that have uh, the hoops with the plastic? Yes, that's a good question, actually. Um, it's, uh, I meant um, uh, floating row covers. It's a floating row covers. We, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I, in Maryland and Virginia and the many, I think many, um, um, and in most part in Pennsylvania, uh, we don't use much uh, low tunnels. Most growers, plastic culture growers, do use low covers, floating low covers. Can I ask um, if it would be one of the outcomes from this that you would be able to potentially develop an algorithm that would compensate the model? for the differences you're finding between the seven foot high weather station and the sensor within or underneath the floating row cover? Um, Do it, you anticipate that might be possible? Uh, it could be possible. Uh, uh, again, you know, at this point, we don't know how much difference uh, between the data from, you know, from the sensors on the covers and the, from the weather stations above the ground. And whether that difference due to the difference in placement, sensor placement, whether that lead to the difference in disease infection, uh, we don't know at this point. But uh, as, uh, when, uh, as we get more data, we should have a better idea, um, you know, it's, if, whether it's possible to, uh, to compensate that. But that's a good question, Judy. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a little tiny bit of time for questions, but I don't see any. So let me just give you a few seconds to think while I remind you that um, we will be sending out an evaluation and we really look forward to your input. And also that we'll send out a link to the recording of this webinar. And I wanna thank the presenters again was very excellent and I appreciate your time. I know that these short presentations are um, in some ways much more difficult than the longer ones. Um, so I appreciate your um, boiling things down. 
Um, and still seeing no questions, either in the chat or the QA. Um, are there any last comments from presenters? And hearing none, I'll say goodbye and thank you again very much for your participation, both presenters and participants in your very good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank much. you for organizing.